All right, we have a really interesting show for you today. You will not hear this anywhere else except for six months from now. That's how it works. We say it here first, and then six months later, everybody else is saying it. So we're going to begin by, you know, truth comes in funny places. I want to pick two guys who do not like Donald Trump. They don't like him at all. One guy on the left, one guy on the right. And I'm going to start, shockingly enough, at the New York Times, a stopped clock and a former newspaper are both right every now and again, right? So let's start by going over to, to the op-ed page, or as we call it, Knucklehead Row. Oh, hey, hey, oh, hey, oh. Let's go down to Knucklehead Row. Okay, here is David Brooks, who hates Trump. The Abby, he calls Trump the Abby Hoffman of the right is Donald Trump. Now, I don't know if you guys remember Abby Hoffman, 1960s, he was what they called the yippies. They were even beyond the hippies. And he was the leader of the uh, riots that took place at the 1968 Chicago Convention. He was a radical. So here is what David Brooks says. It has to be admitted that Donald Trump is doing exactly what he was elected to do. He was not elected to be a legislative president. He never showed any real interest in policy during the campaign. He was elected to be a cultural president. He was elected to shred the dominant American culture and to give voice to those who felt voiceless in that culture. He's doing that every day. I mean, this is living proof that everything ultimately becomes the Andrew Clavin show. You can be reading the New York Times. They will try to resist. They'll attack everything I say or anything, any idea that goes through my head. And suddenly, the New York Times is the Andrew Clavin show, except we've already moved on. We're already giving you six months in the future. David Brooks goes on. What's troubling to me is that those who are the targets of his assaults seem to have no clue about what is going on. That's absolutely right. And also the people who are being helped by his assault sometimes don't even know. When they feel the most righteous, like this past weekend over the NFL, they're actually losing and in the most peril. And here is he, he describes what's going on. He says, after World War II, the Protestant establishment dominated the high ground of American culture and politics. That establishment eventually failed. It tolerated segregation and sexism, led the nation into war in Vietnam, and became stultifying. So in the late 1960s, along came a group of provocateurs like Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, and the rest of the counterculture to upend the Protestant establishment. They never attracted majority support for their antics, but they didn't have to. All they had to do was provoke, offend the crew-cut crowd, generate outra- outrage, and set off a cycle that ripped apart the cultural consensus. Here's Abby Hoffman. Here's a quick cut of Abby Hoffman at the 68 convention explaining what he's doing. That's essentially what we're going to do is throw a lot of banana peels around Chicago and have the machine stumble. And when it stumbles, it gets into a policy of overkill, and it starts to devour itself. So the cops are going to turn on themselves? Or they'll at least, how do you, you, know, you they'll, they'll be time? fighting. They'll be fighting other people in power. See, in Grand Central Station, they weren't just clubbing us long hairs, you see. They started to take on commuters, you know, and people coming home from the opera, and mayor's officials who were wandering around, and FBI agents who were there in secret, disguised as hippies. They're all getting clubbed just like us. Okay, so that is exactly what Donald Trump does. He puts out banana peels and watches his enemies slip on it. Remember, all during the primaries, he's doing it now, all during the primaries, he would do things, and it was it was not that he destroyed people, it was people destroyed themselves because of what he was doing. All right, Brooks goes on and says, the late 1960s were a time of intense cultural conflict, which left a lot of wreckage in its wake, but eventually a new establishment came into being, which we will call the meritocratic establishment, people like David Brooks, right? This establishment, too, has had its failures. It created an economy that benefits itself and leaves everybody else out. It led America into, he's talking about the elites now, he's talking about himself. It led America into war in Iraq and sent the working class off to fight it. It has developed its own brand of cultural snobbery. Its media, film, and music industries make members of the working class feel invisible and disrespected. Through David Brooks, through the medium of David Brooks, people who read the New York Times are now hearing the Andrew Clavin show. (laughs) Okay, they don't know it. But they are. So in 2016, Brooks says, members of the outraged working class elected their own Abby Hoffman as president. Trump is not good at much, but he is wickedly good at sticking his thumb in the eye of the educated elites. He doesn't have to build a new culture or even attract a majority. He just has to tear down the old one. And that's another thing I keep telling you, that we're in a place where things are falling apart. The gravity has left the room. All the furniture is floating around, and we don't know where it's going to come down. But think about it for a minute. Sure, it can get worse. Things can get worse. 
But, but it's, it's so bad for Republicans. We were in this place where the GOP was doing what they call in baseball, losing comfortably. Our democracy was slipping away. Our independence was slipping away. Our federal, federalist structure was all slipping away. And the right and the left were both sitting there. The Republicans were putting up John McCain for president. John McCain. They were putting up Mitt Romney. I mean, they were not putting up the people who represented anybody, not the right, uh, not the intellectual right, and not the base right. Nothing. And so it was just all slipping away. It was all so easy. And destroying that culture, shaking up that culture, is a win for us. Okay, that's on the left, right? So now the left is doing my show, <laughs> the Innovations of the New York Times. And then there's Peter Robinson, a pal of mine, great guy, who was a big speechwriter for Donald Trump. He wrote, or he claims that with Reagan, he wrote uh, the Tear Down That Wall speech. Uh, he now runs the terrific website Ricochet. My friend's over there. And he's at the Hoover Institute and does one of the greatest interview shows ever, uh, which is called Uncommon Knowledge, Peter Robinson. So he writes a piece called Trump Through a Pinhole. And this is the other thing I've been saying for months and months, which is that Trump himself is a distraction from the reality of the Trump administration. Peter says this, during the recent eclipse, NASA urged us all to protect our eyes by turning our backs on the sun itself, observing the eclipse only through pinhole cameras. A similar technique proves remarkably useful in observing the Trump administration. If you ignore the strangely dazzling figure of the president himself, examining him instead the second order effects he's producing, you'll find that a certain reassuring clarity emerges, to wit, Congress may have thwarted the administration's effort to replace Obamacare, but wherever the administration has been able to take action on its own, it has done just that, demonstrating not incompetence, but considerable effectiveness. And again, Peter is not a Trump fan. He says at the end of this, um, let me see if I can find it. He says, uh, Donald Trump is imp impulsive, vain, profane, shallow, loudmouth, inconsistent, and overbearing. But he then goes on to list all the things I've been listing all this time. He appointed Neil Gorsuch, but not just Neil Gorsuch, to the Supreme Court, more than 30 other excellent originalist judges to federal courts. He took away half of ISIS's territory in the Middle East, changing the strategy there. He's been enforcing immigration laws so that illegal entries are down by some 70 percent. He's cutting back business-killing EPA overregulation, cutting back oppressive sexual harassment rules at universities, right, when he rescinded that uh, Dear Colleague letter, eliminating two federal regulations for every new one passed, approving important energy pipelines, pulling out of a useless climate accord and exposing our corrupt all-Democrat all-the-time news media as a corrupt all-Democrat all-the-time news media. I added that one at the end. The rest is Peter Robinson. And now, yesterday, too, Jeff Sessions came out in support of free speech. And if we have time after the mailbag, we'll talk about that, too. I'm telling you, this there's going to be all kinds of stuff that makes conservatives like me, upset because he's, Trump is not a conservative in his legislative heart. There's going to be all kinds of that. But there, is all, there are all kinds of reasons to celebrate. And the right, some of the people on the right are acting like people who cannot take yes for an answer. After all this, I think I'm going to have to give a, Trump, a quick Trump happiness montage. We're going to win so much. We're going to win at every level. Economically, we're going to win with the economy. We're going to win with military. We're going to win with health care and for our veterans. We're going to win with every single facet. Zippity dee da, zippity a. My oh my, what a wonderful day. We're going to win so much, you may even get tired of winning. Yay! You'll say, please, please, it's too much winning. We can't take it anymore. I feel pretty. Oh, so pretty. I feel pretty and witty and gay. We have to keep winning. We have to win more. We're going to win more. Yay! <laughs> Still makes me laugh, that thing. We have, well, I'll have to make a new one. Uh, but again, I've been attacked as an anti-Trumper. I've been attacked as a pro-Trumper. I'm just trying to take a realistic assessment of where we are in the midst of all that noise. You can listen to it now, or you can listen to it six months later someplace else. <laughs>
<laughs> this is why my wife is so annoyed. This is why my wife is so annoyed with me. But, the, but uh, <laughs> it is true. You can listen to it here or you can listen to it elsewhere six months later. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. Over the past few days, I've become grimly fascinated by the anti-Donald Trump protests in America because they are so funny if you watch them or read about them. So you've got all these placards, people saying, you know, white people are stupid, white people are evil, all of which are carried by white people. So you have this hilarious uh, spectacle of self-hatred. You have uh, someone carrying a placard saying Donald Trump is a fascist and doesn't respect democracy and free speech next to someone else carrying a placard saying down with this election result. And then, but my favorite placard of all of them, which was photographed and made its way around the press, was this message uh, on one of the placards to Trump supporters, which said, your vote was a hate crime. And I just thought that was hilarious. I laughed at that as I did at everything else. But at the same time, it was also quite terrifying and chilling. And it wasn't just this one placard that actually chimes with a sentiment that has greeted the vote in America, which is this idea that the millions of people who voted for Trump were acting out of hate. The word you will see in most of the kind of angry newspaper coverage about what's happened is hate. They were acting out of hatred, as if millions of people wake up on election day and march to the ballot box with hate in their mind and hate in their hands and hate. I mean, that's, that's literally how some commentators conceive of these People. And I thought this idea that your, even your vote, even the act of voting can be a hate crime, so it can be a hateful act and a criminal act, uh, I thought was really interesting because what it points to, I think, is the ever-expanding empire of hatred, the, the ever-expanding category of what is hateful. And, you know, over the past few decades, really, we've gone from a situation where Punching someone in the face on account of their racial background is a hate crime to a situation where saying something mean to someone on the basis of their racial background is a hate crime to a situation where criticizing gay marriage or criticizing Islam is a potential hate crime, it's hate speech, to now where going into a ballot box and expressing your deepest beliefs, your conscience, what you think in your heart and your mind, now that is a hate crime too. And I think it's really fascinating, uh, almost uncontrollable expansion of the things that are defined as hateful and therefore as problematic in some way. And, you know, if you just look at the way in which the word hate is used now, it's constantly attached to various things that people simply don't like. So there's, you know, hate crime, of course, there's hate speech, there's hate groups, which is any group that has, you know, dodgy ideas or even not so dodgy ideas. Um, hate newspapers. Currently, there is a campaign to get advertisers to pull out of the Daily Mail, and it's, it's, it's presented as a campaign against hate newspapers. Um, now there are hate websites, and now there is hate voting. Voting itself can be a hateful thing. And what we have is a situation now where if you want to demonize something, if you want to delegitimize a group or an idea or a belief or a way of life, all you need to do is add the word hate at the start of it and you're done. That's it, they're finished. And just to give an example of how this ever expanding empire works and the terrifying impact it can have on freedom of speech, I was really struck that recently um, the Southern Poverty Law Center in the US, which is this group that, uh, this kind of liberal group, which kind of keeps a tab on all hate groups and decides through its wisdom what is a hate group and what isn't. And you know, it, it, it has neo-Nazis and, and racist groups and anti-Semites and various people who we can all agree are quite hateful. Uh, and recently it added to its list people like Majid Nawaz, the British liberal critic of extreme Islam, um, Ayan Ali Hershey, the Somali-born critic of extreme Islam, they have now been added to the Southern Poverty Law Center's lists of people who are, in its words, extremists and who promote hatred of Islam. And I think that is a real sign of how out of control and insatiable the empire of hate has become and the way in which it encapsulates more and more, not, not even 
horrible ideas, not even particularly extreme ideas. If you read Majid Nawaz or uh, Ali Hirsi, these are in, eminently reasonable, intelligent, measured people have now been co-opted into this ever-expanding empire of hate. And I think, um, just to finish, I think th th the problem here is really that what's happening is that the term hate is being used quite instrumentally to pathologize and demonize any idea that any person, I don't think it even necessarily needs to be someone in power, that any person or group finds distasteful or problematic or difficult. And I think we should have no truck with it whatsoever. I think we now even need to move beyond the debate about what's hateful and, not, and what's not hateful, because that I think plays too much into the idea that there are certain ideas that should be unutterable in public life. We need to move beyond that debate and recognize that the term hate speech has no more legitimacy than the term thought crime. And when I hear someone talk about hate speech now, to me, I hear the word thought crime because that phrase is used entirely to toxify certain ideas, to disease certain ideas, to present certain ideas and certain arguments and certain beliefs as um, deserving of punishment. And when you present certain ideas as deserving of punishment, I don't think you can be surprised when as a consequence of that, you give rise to actual real world agitation and real world violence against people who are considered to be hateful, whether it's students who literally chase and scream and, and harass people who are pro-Israel, or whether it's extreme Islamists who will summarily execute people who, are, who, have hate, who commit hate speech acts against Islam, a society which has this ever-expanding empire of what's unsayable because it's allegedly hateful, is a society that's going to generate intolerance and violence and, ironically, hatred. Even when it comes to things that most normal people can agree is hateful or racist or anti-Semitic, um, even then, should, there's no question that it should ever be censored. I think censorship is the worst tool imaginable for um, resolving racism or anti-Semitism or any other kind of ism, because all you do if you censor those kind of things, you, you give them this kind of exotic allure. You make them seem dangerous and, to some people, perversely attractive. You make them more attractive than they otherwise would be. You also never have a reckoning with them and have the discussion out and, and prove that they are ridiculous and wrong and everything else because you simply um, refuse to allow them to be expressed in public. So, in fact, it often backfires. If you look at France, for example, 25 years ago, France outlawed Holocaust denial. Now France has a really serious problem with Holocaust denial and with the new anti-Semitism. And I don't think those two things are, are unrelated. Uh, you know, if you push something like Holocaust denial underground, where it can't be challenged and confronted in a public way, then you are going to allow it to fester. So even when it comes to horrendous ideas and speech, censorship is the wrong answer. The problem with hate speech laws is not simply that there are double standards and some people are punished under them and others aren't. Hate speech laws actually sanction hatred. I mean, they promote hatred because what they implicitly say or explicitly say is there are some people whose views are so intolerant that you should not tolerate them. And therefore, why don't you shut them up? Why don't you punch them? Why don't you try and get them out of your workplace or your university? This, this is what hate speech laws implicitly communicate. And so if you look at modern Britain, for example, you know, we talk, and, and Paul writes fantastically in his, his book, which I highly recommend, about all the supposedly hateful things you're not allowed to say. But we also need to realize that there are lots of hateful things you are allowed to say. There are lots of groups you are allowed to be hateful about. Old people is a very good example. Um, football fans is another example. You can read the most obnoxious commentary about football fans in mainstream newspapers. Working class people, especially ones who vote uh, leave. The commentary I've read about them is, is deeply disturbing. If you read it about any other group in society, there would be a court case the next day. Um, uh, Christians, you can be extremely mean about Christians. And the reason you can be mean about those sections of society is because they are considered to be intolerant. 
So Christians are considered to be intolerant of gay marriage, for example. Football fans are considered to be intolerant because they make very un-PC chants and they sing the Billy Boys. Old people are presumed to be intolerant because they tend to have right-wing views or they don't like the European Union. So hate, the hate speech empire says you may hate them, and in fact you should, because that's your duty in a world in which we want to exterminate hate. It's this extremely <laughs> Kafkaesque situation. So hate speech laws actually sanction the hatred of groups in society. I think, just uh, coming on from uh, Kerry Dingle's point about why there's this obsession with hatred when there's far less of it than ever before, I think that's fascinating. This is one of the reasons I uh, spend my whole life in a state of utter disappointment and fury with the left. Because, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, when, when racism was a serious problem in Britain, the left tended not to say very much about it. You know, they had their anti-Nazi movements, which just focus on seven skinheads at the end of the road, but they didn't talk <laughs> about real racism institutionalized throughout society. They kind of thought that was a bit of a distraction from, you know, demanding a higher wage or something. Now, when there is far less racism than ever before, society gets on with it. We all get on with each other far better than ever before. They're obsessed with hatred and they see it everywhere and they, they go trawling for it even where it doesn't exist because anti-hatred and, and supposed anti-racism are new means of social control. They are new means of controlling what people can think, what people can say, and even how we interact with each other, even how we speak with each other. So I think you should be deeply sceptical of anyone who in 2016 claims to be an anti-racist, especially if they weren't one in 1987. <laughs> uh, because what they are doing, they are actually uh, uh, seeking to control, demonize certain sections of society and control how we interact with each other, not promote tolerance. Yeah, on the question of how can we Im improve public debate, I think it's, it's quite simple, actually. We just need more freedom of speech. And I think it, we sometimes underestimate what a profound impact that would likely have on the standard of public discussion. Because as Paul was saying earlier, the, the, the great thing about freedom of speech is not necessarily what people are going to say with it. That's kind of immaterial in some ways. It's the fact that it, it, it invites us to behave as actual citizens, it invites us to be morally autonomous adults. And it, it, it invites us to take ourselves seriously, to take ideas seriously, to keep in check things that we think are racist, to engage in society in a real way. Where censorship infantilizes us, censorship treats us as children, censorship says, you don't have to worry about what is right and wrong, because we've decided for you. And I think we sometimes underestimate what impact that has on people. If you are no longer required to decide for yourself what is right and wrong, then you are not really a full citizen or even really a full human being because you've been kind of pacified and, and put out to pasture and, and just allocated this very childlike role. I think if we were to have complete freedom of speech, no bans whatsoever on Holocaust denial or racism or anything at all, then the immense responsibility people would feel to engage in society would improve, I think. And through that, you could well see a flourishing of different ways of thinking, different ideas. People would have to come up with uh, new manifestos to challenge this and, and new ways of challenging that. And I think that would enliven and enlighten public debate in a very real way. So I think that's the first and most important step we need to get rid of all censorship. Following on from that, it, the question of what kind of censorship is most problematic, and the, the question in the front row made me think about this in terms of what hate speech laws do. Do they help victims or do they just tell people off? Uh, you know, my real concern is, is not with the... I, I'm terrified by the way laws are used to punish priests for criticizing homosexuals or, or, or Bridget Bardot for saying that the way Muslims slaughter meat is barbaric. She's actually been fined for saying that. All of that stuff is terrible. But even more worrying than that is the impact it has outside of the law in everyday society, the chilling effect it has in terms of people self-censoring themselves. There was, there's this Iraqi poet and her books, her poetry has been banned in Iraq a number of times. And she recently made this comment where she said, she now lives in America. And she said, in Iraq, censorship is explicit and it follows speech. In America, censorship is implicit and it precedes speech. And I think that is a really <coughs> useful description of the kind of regimes we're living under today, which is not explicit speech, explicit censorship that punishes the book or burns the book that's already published. 
It's much more implicit and we censor ourselves. We simply don't say it. And if you read any interviews with Trump voters, you will see this. There was, there's a fantastic piece in the Washington Post yesterday, interviews with Trump voters, and they talk about things they can't say. They talk, they, one of them uses the phrase, I've, I've been PC shamed in not saying certain things. And, and so the only place they can really express themselves is in the ballot box, in that kind of private space, which is entirely anonymous. That's the only place where they can be honest and say, I want Trump, or I want Brexit, or I want the Tories things they can't say in society itself. That's how shrunken the parameters of acceptable thought have become. So I'm worried about the way in which the whole empire of hate speech, not simply the laws, but kind of beyond that, has this chilling effect that we sometimes don't recognize, where people actually become almost dishonest and public debate as a consequence suffers terribly, I think. Thank you. You often find is that you get to, to a situation where you know people who are agitated by free, sp free speech or unsure about free speech find themselves in a position where they're effectively saying there was too much free speech in Nazi Germany. I mean, that's how they, that's the uh, avenue they go down. If only they had more censorship, then maybe they wouldn't have gone so crazy and killed so many people. And of course, Nazi Germany, uh, I mean, uh, Paul's point is absolutely right that there were hate speech laws prior to the rise of the Nazis anyway, which were used against them ineffectively. But also the problem in Nazi Germany was explicitly one of authoritarianism and censorship, where political groups couldn't organize, Bolsheviks couldn't organize, uh, Jew Jews couldn't publish things or, or, or form political parties or then do anything at all. That surely proves the case that the only guard against that kind of tyranny is freedom of speech. But often you encounter people who are anti-freedom of speech who get themselves into the mess of arguing that if only there'd been more censorship in Nazi Germany, maybe so many people wouldn't have died. We need to face up to the fact and do something about the fact that we live in a society that openly polices emotion and which polices how we feel, uh, how we think and what we say. That is a terrifying prospect and needs to be confronted head on. You know, not only through the policing of hatred with hate speech laws and preemptive uh, self-censorship uh, in relation to hatred, also in relation to anger management, which is a booming industry. It's used uh, 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 on students who are considered to be too angry. It's used on prisoners. It's, it's become this kind of institution. Um, also, the way in which certain ideas are redefined as disorders of some description. There's a new disorder, uh, intermit intermittent explosive disorder, which is basically someone who gets very angry sometimes. Um, and then, of course, there's the way in which, um, as Paul says, all, all these things are redefined as phobias. You know, if you, if you are critical of transgenderism, you are transphobic. If you are uh, critical of aspects of Islam, you're Islamophobic and so on. Of course, a phobia is an irrational fear. It's a mental instability. And, you know, if you look back in history, the, the kind of regimes that redefined certain ways of thinking as, as mental disorders were, were places like the Soviet Union. And that's obviously what happens in 1984, when our hero, Winston Smith, has been interrogated by O'Brien, and O'Brien says to him, you are ill, you are mentally deranged, and we will fix you. That's now what society says to us. It polices how we feel about things. So I think we need to defend freedom of speech, defend the freedom of thought, and defend the right to be angry, to rage against things, and to hate things. I want to make a little defense of hatred. There's loads of things I hate. And hate sometimes gets me up in the morning. And, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this new slogan in America, love trumps hate. No, that is not true. Um, hatred throughout history has been a motivating factor for change. People hate their living conditions. They hate their governments. They hate the predicament they find themselves in. If we throw hatred out, then we're going to get into trouble. That old wheel is going to roll around once more when it does. It will even up the score, don't be weak. As they sow, they will reap. Turn the other cheek and don't give in. That old wheel will roll around. Yes, 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 go on, go on. Hi, everybody, Dennis Prager here. The second hour every Wednesday is the male-female hour. There are only two exceptions in the course of four years 
the, the, the show has been on about 10. I mean, the show has been on 35, but the male-female hour. So I got to explain. In any four-year period, it's really only twice that I know of that we de- defer the male-female hour, actually cancel it. And that is when it is the day after a national election, Congress or president. So it's pretty consistent. Hi, everybody. Now I have to give a warning here. The subject today is not suited for little kids. You decide with regard to teenage kids. It, it's, it's, it's not going to, uh, it's just not talk that little kids need to hear about. If it, I, I like protecting the innocence of the young, and I like destroying the innocence of the old. <laughs> That's the way that I would uh, characterize. I'm laughing because it sounds terrible, destroy innocence. I, I'm i thinking of innocence in terms of naivete. You, an adult should not be naive. It's quite good when a young person is. So you protect the shell in which they live when they're very young. But as you get older, sorry, it's time to confront the world, to be aware of truths. And be, awareness of truths is a big part of the male-female hour. I can't tell you. It, it's you, you would be stunned at the number of people who stop me and thank me for the male-female hour. In particular, uh, the, the females. I, I was flying back from, uh, from Texas and... Three of the four flight attendants, they were all female, uh, you know, asked to have selfies with me. And again, it, the male-female hour, male-female hour. By the way, any woman who likes the male-female hour, it is a great credit to her because a lot of what is said is difficult to embrace and I understand that. And that today's topic will fall in, under that category. You know, there is a, I'll get exactly to the point of the subject, but all of this is relevant to what I, the point. There is a famous book, I think it was written in the 50s or 60s, The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. And his thesis was that the human being denies death because it enables us not to confront uh, the most uh, painful subject of all, that we're all going to die. And I have thought about that all of my life, and I think that there is a, a bigger denial in the human species, the denial of evil. And today I want to talk to you about a third denial. And it was with regard to male sexuality. A lot of women just don't want to know about it because it's scary. It's scary because it is so utterly different. It is scary because unchecked, it is quite dangerous. And uh, people, and it's and it's scary because it's unknown. Male sexuality is so different from female sexuality that uh, it is, I I really believe it's almost impossible for a female to fully comprehend it. I often say it's like asking a man or a woman, for that matter, to comprehend an orangutan. You can't. You can know about orangutans, but to truly empathize is not possible. It's just not possible to empathize with male sexuality if you're a female. It's just the way it works. It's not a flaw. (laughs) It just is. But it's still important to know about it. And so here is today's theme. I have a theory. I have a lot of theories. That's what comes to my brain when there is silence. Theories. So here's a theory for you. A lot of women complain that their husbands uh, are, don't talk. They don't communicate, they don't talk, and I I believe that that's true. I think that is true about a lot of uh, husbands, a lot of men. 
but I have a theory that for some, perhaps many, perhaps most, I don't know the answer. It is related to the following. They don't feel that they can talk to you about their sexual nature. They are afraid to. They are afraid that you will judge them as bad, that you will judge them even maybe as sick, that you will judge them and you will be angry at them or you will be hurt because many husbands actually love their wives and so they don't want to hurt their wives. So they both fear the reaction, the judgments, and they fear hurting the woman that they love, often the mother of their children. But if you have something important in you that you feel you have to hide, then you clam up. You just become quiet. A woman would. If there was a major part of your being that you felt afraid to tell your husband about, you would get quiet. That's my thesis. And what the this male-female hour has enabled a lot of couples to do is I'm acting, as it were, on behalf of your husband on occasion. I always say at the beginning of the show, I didn't today, I'm not a man fan, I'm not a woman fan, I'm a good person fan. The purpose of this show is not to argue on behalf of either sex, but to have both sexes understood. So, uh, uh, But I do know that the program that this hour serves often to explain men to their woman, their wife, their girlfriend, and that is because he can't. Either he can't find the words, or or more likely... He is afraid to. One eight Prager seven seven six. So, if you are a man, do you feel that you cannot speak freely about your sexual nature to your wife, to your girlfriend? And uh, if you are a woman, how does this resonate with you? This theory of mine. It is uh, to speak personally, and I I do put myself out there and it's it's not easy to do so but it's it's very effective because it makes all of this that much more real uh, i it has been a, a major joy in my life that i can be open about my nature with my wife and therefore it's it what happens is It defangs the monster to the woman. And it can actually become a source of fun for both the husband and wife instead of a source of fear. 1-8-Prager-776-877-243-7776. If you're a man, do you resonate to not being able to talk about this? And if you're a woman, how do you react? You are listening to the Male Female Hour on the Dennis Prager Show. We'll return in a moment. And once again, 877-243-7776. Speak to you when we come back. What if I... Hi, everybody. This is the Male Female Hour on the Dennis Prager Show. The second hour every Wednesday. Honest, truly honest, sometimes difficult. This is one that, this is one that goes under the heading difficult because it is about the most sensitive area, I believe, between a man and a woman, the sexual arena. And I have a theory, and I've long believed this. This is not new. I I actually believe this since I was in my 20s. I got married first. I have been divorced. 
I got married first, and I am married now, as just for the record, <laughs> uh, when I was 32, and so obviously all of my 20s I was single. And I'll never forget a, a, a wonderful guy that I played racquetball with regularly. He and his uh, brand new wife were having a dinner with me. We were at a restaurant. It was just the three of us. And me, in my open way, always been open about this. I got that trait to be open about sexual matters for my father. May he rest in peace. And we were talking about playing racquetball. She asked, so how's the racquetball go- going, guys? And I said, oh, it's terrific. You know, we, we really love it. And there's always this little bonus because in between games, I, I step out of the court and I sit down at the bench. And all these uh, good-looking women uh, are walking by in their shorts or their their longs or whatever they're called, you know. So it's like a little uh, little nice uh, intermission between games. And I I got a kick under the table from my friend, the guy I played racquetball with. And it was uh, clear that this was a sensitive matter that he didn't want to be discussed because, and he was right, because she then said to him, well, uh, let's, let's say his name was John. John, you, you don't look at these women, do you? You're not looking at these women, are you? And he said, no, 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 no. Den- Dennis is, you know. Speaking on his own behalf, as it were. <laughs> and then, uh, I I remember thinking, whoa, I am not going to get married with that stipulation. I, I am not going to hide from my wife that I see uh, beautiful women and notice them don't stare, I don't gawk, I don't ogle, but I do look. And that is part of my nature, and I am not going to suppress it, and I am not going to deny it. How can I have my partner in life not know who I am? That's part of me. It's not all of me, as is well known. (laughs) I have other concerns in life, but that is part of me. So my theory is that that hiding of that aspect of a man may contribute to a man being silent. There may be many other factors, and I don't think it's a good thing. I think the more they talk to each other, the better it is. Okie dokie, let's go to your calls. Heidi in Chicago. Phone number here, by the way, is 18Prager776. Somebody just Hello? hung up, so there's a... Uh, yeah, you're on, Heidi. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, second time caller. I love your show. Great. And I love this topic because your theory is spot on. My husband and I, we do... We communicate about just what you were talking about, and we have a great sex life. And... I'm okay. That I understand that he looks at women just like you were saying in that way, but women also do the same thing towards men. Well, it isn't the same thing. Of course women look at men. Thank God they do, I might add. Uh, but, uh, I, <laughs> but maybe not in... It's not the right. same. It just isn't the same. The effect is not the same. If, 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 no. you know, if, if 20 guys walk by in the racquetball place wearing shorts... It's not going to have the same impact as twenty uh, young women walking by in shorts. Okay, no. so uh, we, this is true. it's it's very but, important. Not I don't I'm 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 only reacting because it's important for you to know there isn't truly a parallel. This is true. Okay, you're you're right. Okay, um, but just based on your theory about communicating about what it is men are like what, when it comes to sexuality. Through trial and error, we figured it out, started communicating, and like I said, we understand each other. My husband 
read a book all about how the woman's sexuality works, and he understands how I function and work as well. And our, I mean, married 15 years, two kids, and I still feel like we're dating. That's the best. So here's my blessing to you. May you and your husband feel like you're dating forever. Oh, thank you. My parents did. They were married 69 years, together 73. My father spoke about how gorgeous my mother was to everybody <laughs> who, who entered the house. <laughs> and I might add, my mother was gorgeous and was till she died at 90. And it was very important for her to be good looking for my father. Very, and, and this was a great model to me. His openness about the subject and her uh, femininity, and she was one strong woman. The feminist notion that femininity and strength are not, uh, are, are mutually exclusive has been one of the most damaging ideas of my lifetime. But other than that, it was a great thought. Yes, it, it does. It only contributes, like in Heidi's case, to a better marriage. Okay, I thank you, Heidi. We've opened the line, one eight Prager 776 And let's go to Fred in Ontario, California. Hello, Fred. Dennis Prager. Yes, I would like, uh, I wish that women understood that to the average man, and I never could tell this to my wife, but if you're not working on your weight, if you're if if you don't have if you're not working to keep your figure nice, then forget about lipstick, forget about earrings, forget about painting your nails, forget about doing your eyes and all of that. It just it pales in the importance of looking good to a man that uh, your your figure is absolute number one, and. I never could say that to my wife, uh, and, but it seems I just I just see it everywhere. You know, overweight women wanting to you know spending so much time on on everything. Well, else. the fact that yeah, I need to react to that. We'll be back. Well, my friends, welcome back. Dennis Prager here. Male, female hour every Wednesday, the second hour of my program. Very difficult subject today. Very sensitive. The most sensitive I think there is between a man and a woman. And it's precisely for that reason that it's so important to address honestly. So my theory that a lot of men don't speak to their wives or their girlfriends about their sexual nature. They're afraid to do so. They don't want to hurt their loved one and or they're simply afraid of being judged adversely, I might add. So this man just called and he hung up uh, after that, understandably. I really thought that when we went to break, the call was over. But it was clear the passion in his voice and he said his call was, it doesn't matter, the cosmetics don't matter, the, the painted nails don't matter, the jewelry don't, doesn't matter, the figure matters, the woman's figure. And he could never tell that to his wife, and I, I'm sure that their relationship in some way suffered as a result of it. This probably, there is nothing more sensitive than this particular one, so, but I want to address it because it's so important. You remember that ad for Geico where Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe, is asked by his wife how she, does she look fat in this dress? And Abraham Lincoln, the eloquent, and Abraham Lincoln, the courageous, and Abraham Lincoln, the honest, was in pain. Was pa- I can't believe, actually, that the the ad didn't arouse feminist ire, but in any event, it apparently didn't. Because it's so tough for a, a man to address. Weight is a very sad and serious issue uh, in, in society, and particularly for women. And I say particularly for women 
because in the human species, she is the, her looks are the arousal mechanism that keeps the species going. Among peacocks, it's the male who is the arousal mechanism that keeps their species going. So they're all colorful and decked out compared to the female peacock. In the, but in the human species, it is the female. It's a burden on women, terrible burden. Men have terrible burdens too, by the way. I know that this comes as a shock to those of you who have a PhD, but nevertheless, it is true. Both sexes have real burdens on them. There are expectations of men, and there are expectations of women. Is it fair? It's like asking, is it fair that we get colds? It's part of life. We get colds. Is it fair? I don't know. It just is what it is. And this issue is a very difficult one. And most men, totally understandably, can't say anything. They clam up. The sex life seems to diminish and there are repercussions to that in a marriage. What is he going to do about it? Is he going to have a mistress? And there are some men for whom the weight issue is a non-factor, and those men and women are blessed. But for most men, it, it is. And we're not talking about the absurdly thin models of Victoria's Secret. There is a big, big gulf between the semi-anorexic look of the Victoria's Secret, most Victoria's Secret, Victoria's Secret models and overweight. There's a huge, huge area in the middle. But here is the key. It is a statement of a woman to her husband, to her man. It is a powerful statement that I love you if she cares about her looks. That is a great, great statement to a man, knowing that she cares about how she looks for him. Believe me, one doesn't have to be a model. You're listening to The Dennis Prager Show, The Male Female Hour. Hi, everybody. You're listening to the Dennis Prager Show. And this is the male-female hour, the second hour. Of my show every Wednesday. Um, The reason for the silences was I was looking at your calls to see the subjects that are coming in. Very tough subject, and the subject is male silence in marriage, and uh, that I'll deal with on another day about other reasons, what you might think of that. But I think one reason, and this is the bigger issue today, uh, is that men are afraid to speak about their sexual nature to their wives. They feel they'll be judged, or they feel it will hurt their wife, one of the two or both. Okie dokie, and uh, let's go to some more of your calls here. Barbara in Albany, Oregon. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Hi. I love your show. I just love it. But, you know, I was thinking if women would see the male sexuality as a compliment, that might change their whole attitude. I see it as a compliment. It's wonderful. I love it. And my late husband used to need sex every day. And I felt it was a great compliment. He was one lucky dude. <laughs> so if they would <laughs> see it as a compliment, that would, right. I think that would change their whole attitude. And before, I want to thank whoever came up with that uh, bring food, get nude. Yeah. 
my husband said, what did they say today? And I told him, and he laughed, and he said, that's it. And, you know, we have had more fun with that. I think that's terrific. I'm sorry he's your late husband. Well, this one is my present one. I remarried. So. Oh, I see. And and it's uh, equal. It's similar in in, in uh, to the first well, one in this regard. In say, uh, well, no, he's older, so it's not every day. Uh-huh. No, I but understand, it, but it's still good but, and open. Oh, and absolutely. you still see it as a compliment. Yeah, you should lecture. You should be sent to every uh, college in the country to lecture young women. You should. I, I mean that completely sincerely. They would be so shocked, I think, they wouldn't know what to do with this woman. See it as a compliment? Doesn't that reduce us to sex objects? This is the... This, this is the see, uh, feminism is based a lot on fear of men. A lot out of envy of men. It is a very unhealthy movement, psychologically speaking. And it is not a movement for equality. Every, everybody with a, with a brain that functions normally believes in the equality of the sexes. It's, it's a non-issue any longer. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like fighting uh, uh, against slavery. Slavery is over, okay? There is no more slavery. Uh, so, but in, in real life, this is what uh, is the, this is the issue in real life. Okay, let's go to more of your calls. And Claudia in Mesquite, Texas. Hi, Claudia. Dennis Prager. Mr. Preger, let me tell you, I love you. Good. I'm glad. I'm honored. Thank you. My husband now, second husband, unfortunately, introduced me to you four months ago, and I cannot stop listening to your show, so thank you for the issues that you bring up, and it's very healthy to talk about this. Um, I just want to let you know that I was married in 19 to... I'm from Romania originally, and I was married in 19 to a very unhealthy marriage. But I thought he was healthy at the time, and I was married for 10 years. And I never had my ex-husband talk to me. And every time I pointed something out, he wouldn't just open up. But now I have a husband, and his name is Adam. <laughs> he ta- We talk about everything, like everything. Everything that's in his mind, in my mind, and he's and so and, and, and it include and includes his sexual nature. Absolutely, absolutely. And you were not afraid of it. No. From the beginning. I honor it. I appreciate it. Well, well how about in the very beginning? Okay. No, I'm, I'm asking you. In the very beginning, was it somewhat frightening? No, it was how we started dating. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Can't be honest. Yes, him being honest, and it was beautiful, and it is beautiful because it's like integrity. It's it's everything. Well, that's great. Thank you. That's what I think. I think openness is the best. Folks, I am more open with you than a lot of people are in their marriage. I'm not joking. I I have no doubt about that. So if I if I'm open with a few million people, I I promise you it's good to be open with the, the person most important to your life, your spouse. <laughs> All right, uh, Kenneth in Orlando, Florida, Dennis Prager. Hi. Hello, good afternoon, Mr. Prager. Uh, I admire you a great deal. Thank you for taking my call, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I believe your topic is on, but I believe that the the, the uh, problem is more based in some of Western society's belittlement of the male gender in, in, in specifics, that they, uh, the female gender has been empowered and the male has gone from um, Father Knows Best to Al Bundy and gone from John Wayne to, uh, goodness, just there, there's no macho attitude, there's no belief in oneself, there's no ability to express oneself because if you are macho or if you are male, and you dare to express it, then you are merely a Neanderthal that needs to be controlled. You're right. It's correct. I was. I. I don't remember the ad, but it was just. I would say in most ads that depict a couple, the man is an idiot. Just is. It's the way the way it is. And we it was. The contempt for father knows best, but that 
sort of working myth a father knows best was actually good for men and women and for kids. It certainly beats you don't need a father, which is the current uh, doctrine. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, everybody. You're listening to the Dennis Prager Show, the male-female hour. And the subject today is men hiding their sexual nature from their wives and not discussing it, uh, hiding it, fear, fearful of judgment and fearful of hurting their wife. And we go to, to Candy in your Belinda and my Belinda, California. Hi. 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 What a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. I just wanted to share that my husband and I, um, he, well, he told me over the last several years, you should listen to Dennis Prager because um, of all your good advice. And I used to be a really jealous wife because I didn't get the men's sexual nature thing. And when I started listening to your show and you explained it so beautifully, I got it. And it's like you said, we have fun with it now because <laughs> I'll say, hey, honey, what do you think about that gal over there? You know, what about, do you think she's pretty or this? And we don't have fights anymore. You know, he used to think, you're so jealous, but I get it now. And we've been married 36 years and we really love each other. And it has helped me with um, understanding men's sexual nature. I get it. It doesn't mean he's a cheater or he's, you know, lustful or anything. He's just got something that God put in men for a reason, and he knows how to control it, but he comes home to me every day. Have you seen the Prague University video, He Wants You? Yes, I have. Good. Okay. And I get it. Well, I just want you to know... I mean, I I couldn't have engineered a better final call (laughs) for this hour. I I must say, you made my day. That's why I broadcast in general. That's why I do everything I do. Yes, you can have fun with it. It can go from fear to fun. That's a good good title. I ought to do another book on, or I do a book on men and women. From fear to fun. I got to write that down. Thank you for that, Candy. God, Jeffrey, and. California. Brother cheated with a hooker because he was unable to be open with his wife and then killed himself after being caught. There's a lot of pain out there. And Julie in Omaha, you got to call me on the third hour on Friday. Her husband cheated, and so it's hard to accept his nature. I'd like to talk to you about that. Stay tuned. We continue. I'm Dennis Prager. Dennis Prager. 